We bring you all the updates on the vote count, plus all the allegations of voter irregularity. President Trump says he's only losing thanks to voter fraud, and Democrats launch an internal battle against themselves as recriminations break out over a rotten election day for Democrats. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Don't let others track what you do. Keep yourself safe at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We're going to get to all the news, and there's plenty of news today. We'll get to all that in just one second. First, let's talk about the fact that you're spending too much money on your cell phone bill. You are. You're spending way too much money on your cell phone bill, like probably hundreds of dollars too much every year. Why? Well, because they're charging you for unlimited data. Now, are you using unlimited data? Of course not, because that's not possible. You can't use unlimited data. The reality is you are using far less data than you are paying for. What if there were a company that cut down on all of that? Well, that's what you get with Pure Talk, a veteran-run wireless company. Think AT&T, but much better. They understand what it means to serve. Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. If you're with them, you're overpaying pure and simple. Pure Talk can easily save you over 400 bucks a year. Listen, here's what you need. Unlimited talk, text, and two gigs of data for just 20 bucks a month. If you go over on data usage, they don't charge you for it. So really, there's no downside. Switching to Pure Talk is the easiest decision you will make today. You can keep your phone and your number, or you can get great deals on the latest iPhones and Android as well. Grab your mobile phone dial pound 250, say Ben Shapiro to get started. When you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. Dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro. They have a very simple program they're offering you, all these other cell phone companies. They're going to try and confuse you with what exactly you're getting for your money. The answer is not much. This is why you should go check out Pure Talk by dialing pound 250. Say keyword Ben Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. Okay, so here is where things stand. Right now, pretty much everything's too close to call. Pennsylvania, too close to call. Georgia, too close to call. Arizona, too close to call. And the election rests on those three states. Trump needs all three in order to win the election. Michigan is out of range for him. Wisconsin is out of range for him despite allegations of voter irregularities in Michigan and Wisconsin, all of which, by the way, should be pursued because only legal votes should be counted and all illegal votes should not be counted. This is an uncontroversial statement. The fact is that the amount of voter irregularity in Michigan or Wisconsin is unlikely to overcome the deficits that Trump has in those states, which means that in order for Trump to win the election, he needs to win Arizona, where the margin has been steadily decreasing over time. He needs to hold on to Georgia, where the margin has also steadily been decreasing over time, but in the opposite direction. And he needs to hold on to Pennsylvania, where the margin has been decreasing also in the wrong direction for Trump over the course of the last 48 hours. All of those states are too close to call. There will be litigation in all of those states. So a few predicates before we get into the actual news, a few things that we ought to discuss. First of all, there's a lot of talk about voter irregularity and voter fraud. These are real things that do happen. The scale of them is not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of votes by the available evidence, but To pretend they do not happen is to ignore the fact that they do, in fact, happen. And, in fact, this has happened in places like Philadelphia. In fact, just back in May, reporting for the Philadelphia Inquirer, Mensa Dean and Julie Shaw, a former judge of elections and Democratic committee person from South Philadelphia, has pled guilty to accepting thousands of dollars in bribes to inflate the vote totals for three Democratic candidates for common pleas court judge in 2015 and for other Democratic candidates for office in 2014 and 2016, according to U.S. Attorney William McSwin. Dominique DeMuro, 73, pled guilty to conspiracy to deprive Philadelphia voters of their civil rights by fraudulently stuffing the ballot boxes for the judicial candidates and for other candidates seeking office in the 2014 and 2016 primary elections. He admitted violating the Travel Act that forbids the use of a cell phone to promote illegal activity as well. Apparently, DeMuro, who could not be reached for comment, was paid between $300 and $5,000 for each election. According to the prosecutors, DeMuro fraudulently stuffed the ballot box by literally standing in a voting booth and voting over and over and over as fast as he could while he thought the coast was clear. This is utterly reprehensible conduct. The charges announced today do not erase what he did, but they do ensure that he is held account for those actions. DeMuro admitted that a political consultant paid him to add votes for Democratic candidates running for the bench and other federal, state, and local offices as well. In May 2014, DeMuro inflated vote totals by adding 27 fraudulent ballots in the primary election, 40 votes in May 2015, 46 in 2016. According to court documents outlining the scheme and the charges against him, those numbers may have seemed small, but they made up a significant percentage of the total votes cast at that particular voting place. In 2014, 118 total ballots were reported there. That meant DeMuro's fraudulent votes accounted for over 22% of the total voting in that division in 2014. So again, is that like a huge number of false votes? It's not a huge number of false votes, but you start to aggregate stuff like that and it could start to look kind of ugly. And this is also true if you look at the possibility of voter fraud in Philadelphia, if you're talking about, for example, the new Pennsylvania court ruling that went up to the Supreme Court and then was remanded back down because the Supreme Court didn't act on it regarding when ballots are to be accepted. This is the really controversial provision that went all the way up to the Supreme Court in which the state law is very clear that you're only allowed to count ballots that have been received 
up to election day. And then they changed that because of COVID. And the, the courts suggested they could single-handedly rewrite that. So if a ballot was received before November 5th or 6th, and if it was postmarked as of election day, then it would be counted. And even if there was no countervailing evidence that it was cast before the deadline, then it would be counted. Right? So those votes are apparently technically being sequestered. It's unclear whether they're being counted or not, and then they'll have to be uncounted and all that. The question really is the margins. If the margins are very large, then this sort of voter fraud is not going to decide the election. With that said, it undermines the integrity of our elections that any of this is an issue in the first place, obviously. Okay, so that is issue number one. Voter fraud, voter irregularity, these are real things. Are they hundreds of thousands of votes? No. Are they tens of thousands of votes? Probably not. Are they thousands of votes? Maybe. Are they hundreds of votes? Probably. Okay, so the margins of victory matter an awful lot here. Okay, so that is just as by way of background. By, second, you actually need evidence to prove this sort of stuff, right? So suspicion that bad stuff is going on is not sufficient to prove that voter fraud or voter irregularity is responsible for the outcome of an election. Right? Just like in everything else here on the show, we demand evidence of allegations that are made. Now, the left is famous for suggesting that evidence is unnecessary where it doesn't support their narrative. And they'll suggest that every white cop shooting a black person is an act of systemic American racism. And then when we go through the actual facts of the case, it turns out that it is not. And the left will simply ignore that. When allegations are made of a particular criminal activity, it seems to me there should be evidence of that criminal activity. So all of the allegations should be investigated. All of it should come out. All of the lawsuits should be filed. And we should all just take a chill pill and wait a little bit. I understand everybody wants to know the outcome of the election. I understand that everybody is impatient. But guess what? If we find out on Monday who won the election, or if we find out two weeks from Monday who won the election based on the investigation of all of these allegations, the world will not be materially changed in any way because all the votes have already been cast. Okay, that's the end of the story. And the, the rush by media outlets who want to announce this thing, the rush by Democrats who want to announce an outcome, the rush that you're getting from Various members of the media going to foreign countries and saying, look how humiliated America is. In the, like, wh why in the world would I care what the Germans think of our election? The only reasons they can even hold elections is because we gave them elections. If it were not for us, elections would not be a thing in Germany. So I'm really not interested in hearing from the German government exactly what they think of our free and fair elections here in the United States. So everybody needs to take a chill pill and let the process play out, is I guess what I'm saying here. And we should always make sure that serious allegations are supported and that allegations are supportable. Okay, so that's point number one and point number two. Point number three, Democrats are very upset today because President Trump did a presser yesterday in which he declared basically the only way that he can lose is through voter fraud. Now we'll get to the actual, the actual allegations Trump is making there in just one second. Suffice it to say that on the, Democrat, on the Democratic side of the aisle, they have not only no leg to stand on, they do not have stumps of legs to stand on on this particular point. Okay, Democrats do not get to claim that they are deeply upset about the undermining of the legitimacy of American elections after spending four years claiming that the 2016 election was a giant bamboozle by the Russians. They do not get to claim that they respect the outcome of elections when they still trot out Stacey Abrams as the governor of Georgia after she lost by 50,000 votes in Georgia. Yeah, that's not the way this works. You guys don't get to run around claiming that you deeply respect the outcome of every election you want, every vote counted, and then use Al Gore as your baton to say that. Yeah, I'm not just making up that Democrats don't respect the outcomes of elections they don't like. They literally do not respect the outcomes of elections they don't like. So I don't like that from any side of the aisle. Okay, once all the votes are in, once all the votes have been counted, once we root out any impropriety, that's the election. And that's the end of it. And that should be a nonpartisan statement. It happens to be a truth that Democrats have not accepted the results of the 2016 election and never did. So it's very difficult to hear from people like Hillary Clinton that now Donald Trump is supposed to preemptively concede the race before all of the legalities are gone through. Right, here is Hillary Clinton just about a week ago suggesting that the election of 2016 was stolen from her using exactly the kind of language that she now decries Trump using. There is an air of illegitimacy that surrounds Trump's presidency, and that just infuriates them. It makes them crazy, and that's a big piece of it. So they have to keep striking out at me because why you why well, there's because lots of I was the candidate that they basically stole an election from I was the candidate who won you know nearly three million more votes they basically stole the election guys and she's not even talking about voter fraud or voter irregularity she's saying the process actually working amounts to stealing right she says that I won more votes than Trump on a roll it's not a popular vote contest lady this was and still is the prevailing notion in the Democratic Party so hearing about the undermining of American elections from Hillary Clinton today and from her allies today, that's pretty rich stuff. It's also pretty rich to hear from Al Gore. So you'll recall 2000, if you're old enough. 
Now, I was 16 in 2000, and I remember that was that's really the first national election that I remember in any detail because it was such a big thing, right? I mean, it got litigated for a month. Al Gore was being trotted out by MSNBC today as a proprietor of election legality. He was trotted out by MSNBC, where he promptly explained that he was a great defender of every vote being counted. Here was Al Gore, the, the same guy who basically forced us to go through over a month of election confusion before the Supreme Court settled Bush v. Gore in 2000, claiming that he is definitely a person who stands up for, uh, for election legality. But the most important principle that I defended 20 years ago that Joe Biden and many others are defending tonight is let's count every legally cast vote and obey the will of the American people. My favorite thing there is when Al Gore says, and I do love it, when Al Gore says that he defends every vote, right, that was his big thing, right? Um, no, some of us have memories, right? Al Gore saying he defended counting every legally cast ballot, that's pure retconning. It just isn't true. He tried to disenfranchise military ballots. The only reason he didn't get away with it is because Joe Lieberman went on national TV and said they weren't doing that. And people in the Gore campaign apparently were pretty pissed, according to contemporaneous accounts. He also demanded recounts only in the areas where he thought he was going to win. And in those recounts, he wanted people to divine voter intent. That was the pregnant Chad controversy, if you remember all of that. Now, pregnant Chad connotes the media's view of men getting pregnant. But back then, a pregnant Chad was just you tried to vote and you may have dinged a Chad, but you didn't actually punch it through on a punch card. And therefore, we tried to divine your intent by looking into our heart. It was a really, really silly time. And Al Gore was the guy standing behind that. He wanted ballots counted that weren't properly cast. He didn't want properly cast ballots counted. And now here he is lecturing us all on election propriety. Like, spare me. Spare me just a little bit. Okay, in just a second, I'm going to get to all of the latest updates from Pennsylvania with regard to some of these voter impropriety allegations and Michigan and, uh, and Nevada. We'll get to all of that in just one second. First, let's talk about something awkward. You ready? Something awkward? Erectile dysfunction. Yep, that was pretty awkward, wasn't it? But here's the thing. If you're suffering from it, that awkwardness may be preventing you from getting the health care that you need. This is why you need to check out Roman. With Roman, you get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for AD, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. If medication is appropriate, Roman will ship you real medicine with free two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward, simple, and discreet. Getting started is really easy. Just go to GetRoman.com slash Ben, complete an online visit. ED used to be tough to talk about. Now there is Roman. Complete an online visit today, connect with a doctor, get this issue taken care of. Now, a lot of people will live with a medical issue just because it's embarrassing or annoying to get it taken care of. This is not a medical issue you want to live with. You want to go get it solved, and you can do it quickly and easily and inexpensively. Head on over to GetRoman.com slash Ben. Get up to 50 bucks off your first month of ED treatment, a free online visit, and free two-day shipping. That's GetRoman.com slash Ben for up to 50 bucks off your first month of ED treatment. GetRoman.com slash Ben. Again, that's G-E-T-R-O-M-A-N dot com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Okay, so here is the actual latest when it comes to developments in Pennsylvania, as I say, that race is too close to call. Trump was up a significant number of ballots. And now the thing is basically a dead heat. Same thing is happening down in Georgia, where briefly this morning, Joe Biden leapt into the lead. Military ballots still have to be counted. Presumably, those will split on, in favor of President Trump, you would think. There's some provisional ballots that still have to be counted. So a lot of these states are still up in the air. There's a lot of controversy over the last 24 hours because the Trump campaign filed a lawsuit uh, and now the appellate Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania has sided with Team Trump, rejecting a deadline extension for absentee voters to provide missing proof of identification. And so basically, the Democrats wanted people to have like three weeks or a month or some extended period of time to show that they were who they said that they were. And uh, that did not materialize. According to the RNC, in a huge victory for election integrity, the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania sided with the RNC and Donald Trump in the challenge to Secretary Bukvar's unlawful deadline extension for absentee voters to provide missing proof of identification. The court has enforced the proper statutory deadline and ordered that those ballots be segregated and not counted. RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel said, the RNC is doing everything in our power to ensure these kinds of issues are resolved and the letter of the law is followed. Right, so again, all of this is worthwhile. The letter of the law should be followed. Okay, also, a Pennsylvania court did mandate access to poll watchers Okay, according to dailywire.com, Tim Pierce reporting, a court in Pennsylvania ruled on Thursday morning GOP observers must be allowed to watch ballot counting across the state. Apparently, they ruled that GOP observers could watch the ballot count from six feet away, but they had been pushed out to like 16 or 100 feet away. 
The court order allows GOP observers to stand closer. Previously, they'd been using binoculars. The Trump campaign, of course, had preemptively declared victory in Pennsylvania yesterday, suggesting that the uh, the number of ballots is uh, is too big for, for Biden to overcome. We'll see whether that is, in fact, the case. Okay, now, as to the actual claims of election fraud in Philadelphia that have been made at this point, some are somewhat substantiable, some are really not. They should all be investigated, as I keep saying. So President Trump said last night that partisan Democrats have allowed the ballots to be received three days after the election. We think much more than that. Well, election officials will be counting ballots that were received between 8 p.m. on Election Day and 5 p.m. on Friday. And again, that is the big issue, right? Because that preliminary ruling suggested that as long as there was no countervailing evidence to suggest that the ballots were cast before Election Day, they have to be counted. So unpostmarked ballots could be counted. Okay, that's crazy. That's crazy. And that will end up back in the Supreme Court. And presumably there will be a ruling on that. Now, is that tens of thousands of votes? Probably not. Is it hundreds of votes? Could be. Could be. And I'm sure that all of them will be for Biden. Okay, President Trump also suggested that uh, they are counting these votes in Pennsylvania without any ID whatsoever. As the Philadelphia Inquirer says, Pennsylvania requires people voting in person to provide proof of identity if it is their first time voting at that precinct. That's also required from anyone registering for a mail-in ballot. Apparently, the Pennsylvania Secretary of State has advised that ballots should not be counted if a name on a mail-in ballot cannot be verified or if identification was not received. And this is where the Trump campaign came in and they said, okay, you don't get a week or a week and a half to provide ID, like you should have done it at the time. It is also true that the Trump campaign was pointing out that Republican election observers were being forbidden from viewing the vote count closely in person. Now, city lawyers for Philadelphia say the GOP representatives observing the counting could see the entire setup of the canvassing room and could watch every detail of the counting process. A lawyer representing the Trump campaign did tell a judge there have been representatives of the campaign observing the counting process. The city solicitor, Marcel Pratt, said in a statement, many representatives of the Trump campaign have been given access to the convention center throughout the entire day. And since Tuesday, just like observers from other campaigns, the board has set up a location from which candidates and party representatives, potentially in large numbers, can easily view the room without impeding the operation. That is according to the city solicitor. But again, why would you be filing a lawsuit if it weren't the case that you were actually being prevented from seeing what in the hell was going on? This led to a bit of a confrontation between Team Trump and Philadelphia officials. Now, it is unclear whether the Philadelphia officials are stonewalling, whether they're violating the law here. So take all of these videos with a grain of salt because very often these videos are slightly out of context. One of the allegations I saw here is that the court order being shown was in order to remand back to the local court for a final order and that the election officials here were waiting for the final order. In any case, here's what that sounded like in Philadelphia yesterday. I can assure you that they're not violating it under any... The order is currently in effect. Michelle, they're not violating you guys had eight attorneys. I think it was eight attorneys entering your appearance on this. I don't understand why eight attorneys need to evaluate this order. I did it all by myself. Okay. It says we that no are... later than 1030 today, you're to follow the election code and we, my people, my clients, representatives are to be within six feet of the process. Okay, so that was Attorney General, former Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi, who is a lawyer for the campaign. Bondi said, we plan on entering that building right now and legal observing, legally observing if there's one illegal vote cast, it takes away from the great men and women of, Pil of Pennsylvania who came out and issued a legal vote. And then she updated later. She said, this is a joke. They moved the fence up, but moved the ballot machines back. This is offensive. And uh, obviously we should, uh, we should change that particular standard. So that, that is where things stand right now. Okay, so obviously these sorts of controversies are not good for the American public. And we need to know all of the details of them and they should all be fully investigated. In a second, we'll get to the response from the Pennsylvania Secretary of State. Okay, we'll get to that in one second. First, let us talk about the fact right now, not a great time to go to an auto parts store. In fact, never is a great time to go to an auto parts store. You stand in line for a long time, then you finally get up front, and then you have to answer a bunch of questions you don't know the answers to, and then they order a generic part online, and then they upcharge you. Or you could just go online and do this yourself. Head on over to rockauto.com. They always offer the lowest prices possible rather than changing prices based on what the market will bear like airlines do. Why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? RockAuto.com is a family business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Head on over to RockAuto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. Best of all, prices at RockAuto.com are always reliably low and the same for professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Why would you spend up to twice as much for the same parts? The RockAuto.com catalog is unique, remarkably easy to navigate. Quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle and choose the brands, specifications, and prices you prefer. 
There's amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Why would you spend too much money when you don't have to? Shop competitively at RockAuto.com. Go to RockAuto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck and write Shapiro in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. So the Pennsylvania Secretary of State, Bukvar, right, who we've mentioned several times here, she is very partisan. She had tweeted a lot about how bad Trump is. She's a Democrat. But she says, listen, I took an oath of office, so I'm not cheating the system. We have the same sort of, uh, of statement from the Pennsylvania AG. Josh Shapiro says, all the votes are going to be counted. And remember that time I tweeted last week about how when all the votes are counted, Biden's going to win? Just ignore that. It turns out that when you have partisan officials in charge of elections, people tend to get pretty suspicious. Here was Bukvar yesterday. Look, these were four years ago. And at the time, I was not in the administration. I was not in any public service. I was a private citizen. It was a personal Twitter account. Um, and, you know, I, it, so, so that. And then when I became Secretary of State, I took an oath, Dennis, and I took an oath to defend and, and protect the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the Constitution of the United States. And partisan politics have no place in the Pennsylvania Department of State or any county elections office. Okay, so, you know, again, is there reason for people to be suspicious? Sure. Is there is there a reason to declare the entire election illegitimate yet? No. Should we see all the evidence come out? Absolutely. And should everybody just take a chill pill and wait for a second while we do all these investigations and while the legal process moves forward? Yes. Okay, meanwhile, in Nevada, similar accusations being made. The Nevada GOP put out a tweet yesterday saying our lawyers just sent a criminal referral to AG Barr regarding at least 3,062 instances of voter fraud. We expect that number to grow substantially. Thousands of individuals have been identified who appear to have violated the law by casting ballots after they moved from Nevada. This is one of the big problems with mail-in ballots generally. Seriously, it's a real problem with mail-in ballots, and it's been a problem for a long time. Right? Jimmy Carter once said that mail-in ballots were rife with the possibility of fraud. I mean, this makes perfect sense, right? I, I just moved from California to Florida shortly before the election. And then I had my mail forwarded to me, right? So I looked at my mail and there they were, my California ballots. And my California ballots arrived in Florida. Now, were I an unscrupulous person, I could theoretically fill out those ballots, vote in California, and then also vote in Florida. Now, I wouldn't do that because it's illegal and because it's immoral. But could people do that? Of course. When you send out a bunch of ballots to people's addresses, assuming they still live there, that does open the possibility of voter fraud. Could somebody have come by my house and picked up the mail in my mailbox while I wasn't there and filled those out and I don't live there anymore and then the ballot gets filled? Sure. But I mean, the possibilities of voter fraud are real. That does not mean that the evidence of voter fraud is necessarily going to materialize in the numbers that you would need in order to shift a major national election. With that said, the Nevada GOP did issue a letter to the Clark County, Nevada District Attorney alleging voter fraud by people who are not legal residents of Clark County. The firm of Weir Law Group, LLC, sent a letter to Marianne Miller, who is in, indeed the Clark County, Nevada District Attorney, suggesting that a bunch of illegal ballots have been accepted. They say this firm, in conjunction with Harvey and Benelli, PLLC, represents Donald Trump for president. As you know, we've been concerned for months about improper ballots being cast in the 2020 general election. Yet Joseph Gloria has yet to take any reasonably basic and fundamental steps to ensure mail ballots are free from fraud and abuse. His inaction has had and continues to have material adverse consequences on our election security. We have confirmed thousands of votes have been cast improperly. Indeed, we have initially identified over 3,000 voters who moved from Nevada before the election, but still cast ballots in this election. We verified this by cross-referencing the list of general election voters with publicly available change of address records. For example, demographic experts agree the National Change of Address database only captures about one-third of relocations. So we think that this number will likely grow by 6,000 voters at a minimum. Okay, well, that starts to look closer to the margin of error in Nevada, given the current vote counts. And so, again, all of this should be checked into. Now, does that mean that every allegation of voter fraud is real? No. Does it mean that every voter irregularity report is real? No. It does mean, once again, for the 1,000th time, just as I said earlier this week, you shouldn't declare a victory in an election until all the votes have been counted. This holds true for every single side. And I am amused at the Democrats who say that this is only true so long as Donald Trump is declaring victory, but it is not true if Joe Biden or his team are declaring victory. If, if the Democrats declare victory, we all go home happy. If the Republicans declare victory, they're very immoral and bad. Right? That, that is the way the logic of the media and the Democrats work. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about hiring. So let's say that you have an excellent employee, generally excellent employee, but let's say that it's been a really long week, a really, really long week. And let's say that this particular employee, well, 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 I'm not naming any names, but they ran with Colton Haas. Let, let's, let's just say that that employee decides that, you know, Friday morning, 
time to get a little lazy. It's a lazy Friday. You know, let's just, just let, let's ease off a little bit. Sure, the election could be theoretically called by major media outlets today, but I'm just going to arrive, like, you know, like 45 minutes late to the show. And, but, and, then, and then announce that I had a really good sleep. Well, at that point, you might want to head on over to ZipRecruiter.com. ZipRecruiter will do all the work you need them to do because they will help you fill those jobs, such as if you were going to hire in replacement for the aforementioned Colton Haas. First, when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 job sites with just one click. Then, ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology finds people with the right skills and experience for your job and actively invites them to apply so you get qualified candidates fast. It is no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter gets a quality candidate within the very first day. Right now, try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. Upgrade your employees today or find a great employer today over at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. You can try it out for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Okay, so over in Nevada, again, the Trump campaign putting a lot of focus on the possibility of voter fraud and voter irregularity. Rick Grinnell, who is obviously a member of Team Trump and ambassador to Germany, he says, we are not being allowed to check the votes. Ballots are not automatically legal votes until they're checked. We are not being allowed to check. The Harry Reid machine recklessly threw ballots into the mail, and now we cannot check whether or not there are non-residents, which we have evidence, publicly available evidence, that you all in the media should be also looking at. All righty, so there is Rick Grinnell saying that uh, the votes have not been checked there. The former AG of Nevada, Adam LaChalt, he also said that uh, he thinks that there is uh, lots of mail-in fraud. We firmly believe that there are many voters in this group of mail-in people that are not proper voters. In the last many days, we have received reports of many irregularities across the valley. We, we believe that there are dead voters that have been counted. We are also confident that there are thousands of people whose votes have been counted that have moved out of Clark County in the, during the pandemic. The Trump campaign also brought forth a woman named Jill Stokey who claims that somebody took her ballot and voted on her behalf. Here's what she had to say yesterday. My name is Jill Stokey. I went to vote. It was told I already voted. I pursued the matter. And in years past, I always voted in person. This time, they mailed out the ballot, and somebody took my ballot. They also took the ballot of my roommate. I was told by the interviewer from Channel 8, when I said, did other people do this? He said, yes. He said, you're the first double. Okay. A Clark County registrar then said, well, we then talked to her and uh, we checked her signature. It matched and we offered her the opportunity to re-vote and she turned it down. Uh, so again, not every allegation of voter fraud or voter irregularity ends up being true. This is why evidence is usually necessary. Here's the Clark County registrar. I personally dealt with Ms. Stoke. She brought her claim to me. We reviewed the ballot and in our opinion, it's her signature. We also gave her an opportunity to provide a statement if she wanted to object to that and provide a challenge to that, she refused to do so. A member of the Nevada Secretary of State's office investigation team also interviewed her, and they had no issue with the assistance that we tried to give her. Okay, so you know all of this will be litigated. All of this will be litigated. And, th and that's really what it's going to come down to, because as of today, the network started calling the election for Joe Biden. Biden pulled ahead in Pennsylvania. A lot of the mail-in ballots that were still coming in from surrounding counties tend, to, tend toward the heavily Democratic. Trump is making the claim that voter regularity is responsible for this. We're going to see it all litigated out. OK, so that brings us to President Trump's presser last night. So President Trump came out last night and he uh, he said some true things. He said some things that were not so true. It, it drove people absolutely batty. Here was President Trump yesterday. He emerged to say, you know, there's a lot of talk in the lead up to the election about a big blue wave that just did not materialize. Here was President Trump last night. As everybody saw, we won by historic numbers and the pollsters got it knowingly wrong. They got it knowingly wrong. We had polls that were so ridiculous, and everybody knew it at the time. There was no blue wave that they predicted. They thought there was going to be a big blue wave. That was false. That was done for suppression reasons. But instead, there was a big red wave. And it's been properly acknowledged, actually, by the media. 
Okay, okay, he's right about that, obviously. The fact is that Republicans far outperformed what the polls suggested. Republicans are going to end up with maybe 214 seats in the House, which is an unthinkable outcome. Cook Political, which was a nonpartisan outlet, was suggesting Republicans were going to lose anywhere from five to 10 seats. Instead, Republicans are going to pick up anywhere from 10 to 15 seats in the, in the House of Representatives. Plus, there's a likelihood that they maintain the Senate. I know there's a lot of heartburn out there about the two Georgia Senate races, which are both likely going to run off at this point. Okay, I'm, I'm fairly sanguine about those races. The reason I'm fairly sanguine about those races is because Donald Trump is not going to be on the ballot in Georgia. What we've seen across the country, a lot of Democratic ballots where it's just Joe Biden and nothing underneath, meaning the motivation to get out for a special election in Georgia for Senate just to give control to Chuck Schumer. It's not really there for Democrats in huge numbers. For Republicans to stop Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden from having unified control of government, lots and lots of motivation. Plus, the reality is that uh, the one, one of the races and David, David Perdue in that race, he did beat the Democrat. He just didn't get directly above 50%. He ended up like right at 50%. In the other race, Kelly Loeffler, who's going to be the candidate, she's going to unify Republican support behind her. Doug Collins and Kelly Loeffler split the support in that particular race, but they were outpolling the Democrat in that race anyway. So I think the Republicans end up with both of those GA Senate seats. Okay, so Trump is right. There was, in fact, a big red wave. But he is also right. It was the year of the Republican woman. And because the media hate Republicans, they just decided they're not going to comment on it. This was also the year of the Republican woman. More Republican women were elected to Congress than ever before. That's a great achievement. All righty. So he is right about that as well. Then we get to the crux of the matter, right? We get to the heart of the matter that people are upset about. We'll get to that in just one second. First, let us talk about how you can really upgrade your business in a quick and easy way. Business owners, did you know 97% of text messages get open. 90% are open within three minutes. You need to be texting your customers. If you spend time on the phone scheduling appointments, you need Podium. This is what Podium does. Podium makes sure that your business is transferred over to the text message realm. If a business emails me, it usually goes in my spam file. If they try to call me, I'm not picking up unless I know the number. If they text me, then I am likely to actually take a look at the text. This is something that Podium knows. If you're sending invoices in the mail, you need Podium. If you need to convert more sales from your website, you need Podium. Podium is a business messaging tool. It gets you off the phone and into texting. If you're not using texting to reach your customers, you're leaving money on the table. Podium customers have seen some fantastic results recently. A plumbing company converting 16% of their web traffic into leads. A national retailer collecting 18,000 reviews across its locations. A property management company increasing revenue by 20%. Podium is doing everything from helping doctors to notify patients when it's time for them to come inside for their appointments to helping retailers offer curbside pickup or helping car dealers sell cars and deliver them to buyers. It's indispensable. For a limited time, sign up for 20% off your plan with Podium. They're so confident that if Podium doesn't make your business better within 90 days, they'll send you a $150 Amazon gift card for the holidays, which is a pretty amazing deal. Go to podium.com slash Shapiro to get started. That's 20% off if you go to P-O-D-I-U-M, podium.com slash Shapiro again. Head on over to podium.com slash Shapiro today. Okay, so... Then we get to the crux of uh, Trump's press conference. And this is where, this is going to launch a thousand think pieces. President Trump suggests that the election has been stolen from him via voter fraud and voter irregularity. He says they are trying to steal the election. Now, is this an overstatement? I think it's an overstatement because I don't know that they're trying to steal an election. I do think that any suspicion of voter fraud and voter irregularity should be pursued. It's very important to the country that transparency be the byword of the day. It depends on who the they is. It depends on what evidence there is, obviously. Here's President Trump saying that uh, they're trying to steal an election. There's tremendous litigation going on, and this is a case where they're trying to steal an election. They're trying to rig an election, and we can't let that happen. Detroit and Philadelphia, known as two of the most corrupt political places anywhere in our country, easily cannot be responsible for engineering the outcome of a presidential race, a very important presidential race. Now, the reality is that you want to make sure that everything is not corrupt. So any call by President Trump to make the process less corrupt is a, is a good call. Trump then continues to say they never believed they could win this honestly. Democrat officials never believed they could win this election honestly. I really believe that. That's why they did the mail-in ballots where there's tremendous corruption and fraud going on. That's why they mailed out tens of millions of unsolicited ballots without any verification measures whatsoever. And I've told everybody that uh, these things would happen because I've seen it happen. Okay, his complaints about the mail-in balloting process, as I've talked about at length on the program before, I think are not unjustified. I think that the mail-in balloting process uh, 
can be a problem. Is that evidence that it was a problem here or that it makes up the margin of error in these various states, the margin of differential? No, it doesn't. And this is where Trump goes too far, right? He says, if you count all the votes legally, I'm going to win. If you don't count all the votes legally, if you count a bunch of illegal votes, they're stealing the election. How about this? How about I'm filing all the lawsuits that are necessary in order to ensure that the vote count is fair? I suspect that there are many outstanding ballots that are being unfairly counted. You know, that, that would, that's perfectly legit. Him suggesting the only way for him to lose is voter fraud or voter illegality is obviously a broad overstatement, but the president traffics in those. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. If you count the votes that came in late, we're looking at them very strongly. But a lot of votes came in late. Okay, so you know, him saying that, that if you count the votes that came in late, well, we don't know the numbers on that. That's obviously something that should be litigated if, in fact, that is the margin of error in Pennsylvania. And finally, Trump concludes we're going to take all the legal action at our disposal to ensure that only legally cast ballots are counted, which, of course, is legit. I mean, that's, that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine for any candidate is to file any legal challenge that they feel is appropriate in order to ensure the veracity of the ballot. Here is Trump. I have been talking about this for many months with all of you, and I've said very strongly that mail-in ballots are going to end up being a disaster. Small elections were a disaster. Small, very easy to handle elections were disastrous. Uh, this is a large-scale version, and it's getting worse and worse every day. We're hearing stories that are horror stories, absolute horror stories. And we can't let that happen to the United States of America. It's not a question of who wins, Republican, Democrat, Joe, myself. We can't let that happen to our country. Okay, so the legal process will move forward. A president will be declared. That is the way this is going to work. The media, obviously, jumping the gun because this is what they do, right? They're in the business of projecting states. They currently project that Joe Biden is the president of the United States. Decision Desk HQ called it earlier today. NBC News called it earlier today. Uh, they called it earlier today based on Biden taking the lead in Pennsylvania. Again, this has not been litigated yet. This has not gone all the way through the process. Okay, and journalists were fighting mad about Trump saying this stuff. They were fighting, fighting mad. Now, as I say, for, for Trump to suggest that the only way he can lose is if it was voter fraud or voter irregularity is an overstatement. He said it earlier this week, and I said it was wrong for him to say it then, and it's wrong for him to say it now. Right? He should not be saying, because no one should. I mean, we saw Democrats saying it. It's wrong when Democrats say it. It's wrong when Democrats suggest that the only way that they could lose is through voter suppression. Right? I've been, I've been on this bandwagon for a while now that it turns out that sometimes elections go the way you don't want them to. But for the media to immediately dismiss all possibility of voter fraud and voter irregularity or to suggest that anybody who's worried about that is a dupe or an idiot, that's not right. That's not right at all. Okay, so journalists, of course, journalism's all over the place. They lost it. So Jim Acosta and ladies, find you somebody, find you anybody who loves you like Jim Acosta loves Jim Acosta. Here is Jim Acosta you know, celebrating Trump's presidency is disappearing before our eyes. I can't imagine why the trust in institutional media is at all time lows because this guy's an objective journalist who's tubing all over the place. The president is watching the lights go out on his presidency right now. That is what we're witnessing in real time as these votes are being tabulated and Joe Biden is catching up in Pennsylvania and, and in Georgia. The, the presidency of Donald J. Trump is vanishing before our eyes. OK, weird. I don't remember them saying this about Al Gore during the challenges of 2000. I don't remember anybody at CNN suggesting that Stacey Abrams was full of crap after she declared that voter suppression was the rationale for losing her Georgia gubernatorial race. I remember everybody at CNN for four long years declaring that Donald Trump was illegally made president by the Russians. Okay, so no, I, I don't buy this kind of high dudgeon nonsense from Jim Acosta, from Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper came out, he trashed Trump as pathetic, which of course, again, you really want to up the, your, the faith in an objective media, continue along these lines. Here's Anderson Cooper. It's sad and it is truly pathetic. And of course it is dangerous. And of course it will go to courts, but you'll notice the president did not have any evidence that is the president of the United States. That is the most powerful person in the world. And we see him like an obese turtle on his back, flailing in the hot sun, realizing his time is over. Oh, that's a, that's, that's a reporter who's reporting without animus right there. Yeah, I, I mean, it's amazing. I'm, I'm sorry that the media saying that Trump wants to take the country down with them. Yes, our objective media declaring the president a fat turtle on his back in the sun. Yes, I'm sure you guys... Slow clap for the journalistic establishment here. Really, really well done. Really well done. You know, on CNN, I'd say probably four years ago at this point, I said you guys need to take the, the journalism up to an 11 and you need to take the tenor down to a one. And they have decided to do precisely the opposite. And they're just going to assume out of hand that anything Trump says is unworthy of even 
considering the possibility of, they're going to get into high dungeon and then they're going to do the, I mean, uh, what, what makes Anderson Cooper as a reporter distinguishable from Rachel Maddow? I'm missing it. I don't, I don't see anything. I really don't. Okay, well, here is the truth. And we're going to get into this in a second. The reason that the Democrats are, are focusing in on Trump and they're focusing on the Trump-Biden race is because there is something else that happened in the election last night and uh, they don't like it very much. There is significant unrest in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is on the verge of a breakup. They have way bigger problems than the Republican Party. Regardless of what happens with all the lawsuits, regardless of what happens at the top of the ticket, I know everybody wants to pay attention to that. The fact is, election night was a terrible night for Democrats, a terrible night for Democrats. They lost 100 state legislative seats all over the country. They lost state legislatures in New Hampshire. They lost the governorship in Montana. They did not pick up any of the state legislatures they needed in a redistricting year. They are, they are devastated, and they should be devastated. The Democratic coalition is not workable. It is not a workable coalition that is becoming clearer and clearer, clearer every day. And I have the evidence right in front of me. We'll get to that in just one second, because the Democrats are, in fact, in disarray, and they are on the verge of collapse. And the only thing that is masking that is the possibility of a 78-year-old, geriatric, half-senile man supposedly going to act as the glue of the party. Good luck with that, gang. Good luck. Good luck, even if Joe Biden emerges victorious. We'll get to that in just one second. First, let's talk about the watch that you wear upon your wrist right now. So there are a lot of people out there who are going to try and sell you really, really cheap watches for very expensive prices. What if you could get a really quality watch at a price that you're willing to pay? I'm talking, of course, about Vincero. Vincero is dedicated to the craft. They put time and effort into crafting timepieces so you can wear them day after day after day. My dad wears Vincero. My wife wears Vincero. Trust me, I wear Vincero too. I talk about this brand often because I believe in the products they make. Head on over to VinceroWatches.com slash Shapiro. Don't hesitate right now. They're having a site-wide sale up to 20% off anything on their side. I mean, these things look like luxury watches. So check this sucker out. Right, this right here, this Vincero watch, I think it's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful timepiece. And I I'm a watch guy. I love timepieces. At this point, at this price, excellent, excellent stuff. They promise you solid, well-made products you will enjoy wearing. They know how important it is to shop from local brands you can trust. Vincero offers free shipping, 30-day returns, guarantees your watch for two years. That's why they've made over 25,000 five-star reviews because you won't find a better-made watch for this kind of price anywhere else. My listeners have been the hero for Vincero this year. Seriously, the folks at Vincero, they say they're extremely grateful for all your support in a down economic time. So keep the emails, messages, letters going. Most importantly, keep supporting this show and this brand. Continue to support the brand as they support the show. Go to Vincero Watches, V-I-N-C-E-R-O, watches.com slash Shapiro. Take advantage of the sale opportunity. Go get one of my go-to watches at a fantastic price. These are great watches to wear. I give them as gifts all the time. Go check out VinceroWatches.com slash Shapiro again. That is V-I-N-C-E-R-O, watches.com slash Shapiro. All righty, we're going to get to the absolute disarray in the Democratic Party, because that really is the story coming out of the election. I understand everybody still wants to focus in on the presidential election. The reality is this was a bad election for Democrats, a very bad election for Democrats. And that's why you're still seeing an enormous amount of despair in Democratic circles. So wait until I tell you about this. It's pretty incredible. First, you don't want to miss another great episode of the Sunday special coming up this weekend. We'll be joined by historian Victor Davis Hanson to discuss President Trump, his legacy for the Republican Party. We'll be discussing America's context in history, because he is a historian. What does America most resemble? Are we the Roman Empire? Are we the Roman Republic? Like, where are we in history right now looking at the United States? Head on over and watch early at dailywire.com or listen this Sunday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, you may have noticed this has been an insane year. You may have noticed that there is a movement afoot to basically rip away American history. The woke scolds are out there to ruin your life and censor you. You may have noticed that there is a real divide in American philosophy right now. The number one question I get, I get it all the time from parents and from teachers and from just general people. How do I get the people around me to understand American philosophy? Right? How do, what do you mean when you talk about the Declaration or the Constitution? And what do you mean when you talk about there are people who want to overthrow that stuff? Why would they want to do that? I wrote a book. It's called How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. It is more relevant than it was the day of the election. This is the battle that is going to characterize America going forward. Joe Biden represents a facade for the disintegrationists. That has to stop. Go pick up a copy right now of How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps today at Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. You're listening to the, the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So meanwhile, the Democratic Party is in complete disarray. So don't let all of the focus on Trump versus Biden fool you. The Democratic Party has deep, deep troubles. They lost a bunch of seats across the country and they are just, they, they can't stand it. I mean, they're falling apart. 
The DCCC chair, a woman named Sherry Bustos, she told House Democrats, for a person on a House Democrat call yesterday, quote, I'm furious. Something went wrong here across the entire political world. Something went wrong here across the entire political world. Well, first of all, let me just say this. The Democratic Party needs to start using ZipRecruiter ASAP, like ASAP. Do you have any idea who's the head of the DCCC, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee? You know who that was? The, the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is Robbie Mook. You know what Robbie Mook did before he was the head of the DCCC? He was the head of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2016. Okay, that qualifies you for only one job, head coach of the New York Jets. That is the only job that qualifies you for. Seriously, like that's an amazing record. I, I love that. Hey, can you imagine how that interview went? He walks into the DCCC and they're like, oh, Robbie, good to see you. And he's like, oh, good to see you too. And they're like, well, what did you do? What was your last job? It's like, well, I ran the most unsuccessful presidential campaign in American history. And they're like, you are hired, my friend. It's probably gonna go great. And then the DCCC obviously immediately falls apart on the job. So there's a massive internal Democratic meltdown yesterday. There's a Democratic caucus call. And I'm going to read this to you in its entirety because it is so indicative of the fact that the Democratic coalition cannot hold. So Democrats since 2012 have been attempting to replicate the Obama coalition. Right? The Obama coalition was going to be minorities, gays, some suburban women, some woke white folks. And that was going to overturn the, the other 47% of the population it was a new ascendant plurality minority coalition, and it was going to be durable, and it was going to stick together. The intersectional coalition was going to stick together. And it turns out that that fell apart in 2016 when the intersectional coalition didn't show up for Hillary. Well, it turns out the intersectional coalition also did not show up for Democrats in Congress. The intersectional coalition may have shown up because they don't like Donald Trump very much, but they did not show up to get rid of Susan Collins in Maine. They did not show up to get rid of Tom Tillis in North Carolina. They did not show up to get rid of Steve Daines in Montana. They did not show up to get rid of John Cornyn in Texas. In fact, the opposite happened. A bunch of those suburban women turned back, to, back into Republicans in 2020. In fact, Donald Trump got an outsized share of Latino and black votes. And so Democrats are looking at each other going, wait a second, are you the enemy? Are you the problem here? Because here is the problem. The Democrats have some fundamentally incompatible demographics in their coalition. I'm not talking about racial demographics. I'm talking about ideological demographics. So you've got the, the squad who are declaring that socialism is the way forward. And then you've got purple district Democrats who are like, hold up just a second. You're going to get me kicked out of Congress. You've got AOC suggesting socialism is the way forward. And then you've got Latino voters down in Florida, Cuban voters and Venezuelan voters going, hold up. We just came from a socialist country and you are a crazy person. That is not a thing I want. You got a bunch of woke white people who are saying to black people, defund the police and black people looking at them like, are you insane? We need cops in our towns. Are you nuts? You've got a bunch of people in the Democratic Party who believe that the top issue in America is allowing biological boys into girls' locker rooms. And meanwhile, I got a bunch of working class white people going, I don't have a job. This coalition cannot hold together. It is fragmenting. And that was perfectly obvious from the tone and tenor from the Democratic Party. They're in a state of sheer panic right now. The only thing masking the panic is the fact that they think Biden won. That's the only thing masking the panic right now. Because when you get behind the scenes, the panic is absolutely obvious. So here's the proof. Democratic caucus call yesterday. So there's a, a congresswoman named Abigail Spanberger. She's from Virginia. She ran in a very, very tight race. Okay, and she was sounding off. She was sounding off on her election battle. Okay, she is she she won her race by something like 5,000 votes out of 450,000 votes cast over Nick Freitas. Okay, if that ends up being the final margin. She said, quote, we lost races we shouldn't have lost. Defund police almost cost me my race because of an attack ad. Don't say socialism ever again. Need to get back to basics is yelling, right? This is Erica Werner, Washington Post congressional reporter, is yelling. I love that. I love that. Okay, if we run this race again, we will get effing torn apart in 2022, Spanberger says. Okay, then Nancy Pelosi, who has run this party directly into the ground. Remember, her great legislative achievement under Donald Trump is a failed impeachment. That's it. You can't name any of the other things because they don't exist. Pelosi came back on and says she disagrees. They won the House and the presidency. You lost seats in a year you were supposed to pick up seats, lady. Okay, you may not have won the presidency. We'll find out. If you did, it was by the narrowest possible margin over a candidate you guys said was so historically unpopular that Joe Biden was going to win 55% of the vote and 400 electoral votes. And then Pelosi says, we have a mandate. We have a mandate. First of all, I hope that Nancy Pelosi believes that. I hope that the House Democrats decide they're going to push forward with, let's force your kindergarten to learn that, that Sally has two moms. I, I seriously, like, I hope that this is the Democratic Party platform moving forward. Green New Deal, 
transgender rights. Like, do it. Go for it. Go for broke on the cultural issues. Do it. I'm, I'm begging you. Do it. Yes, good, good. Also, earlier in the call, Debbie Mercado Powell, who lost her race in Florida, was crying, and she mentioned how people can't pronounce her name and said, stop being negative on Twitter. Then Hakeem Jeffries came back on to tell people to stop leaking and that reporters aren't your friends. Then Representative Jayapal came on and told Jeffries to find the leakers. Erica Werner says it just keeps going as Pascrell now calling out Schumer. Pelosi's done an amazing job, but where's Schumer in all this? Says Pelosi has one hand tied behind her back. Rashida Tlaib says, before we make painful statements, we need to wait and see how the numbers come down. Feels like I'm being asked to be quiet and we need to appeal to certain people and that's not right. So Tlaib is like, you're trying to silence me. You're try- One of the loudest members of Congress. You're trying to silence me. And then Tlaib says, they called Obama worse. They called him a Muslim, a socialist. You can blame these words, but if it wasn't on BLM, it would have been on something else. Okay, no, the, the reason it didn't work on Obama is because Obama was not, in fact, easily paintable as a socialist. You guys decided to run Bernie Sanders. The honorable estimable Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez was a registered member of the Democratic Socialists of America and declared socialism is a good idea. Barack Obama never did that because he's not an idiot. You guys are idiots. <laughs> okay, that is the problem. So, so that's pretty hilarious. Okay, and then, so Joe Biden has a mandate, said Speaker Pelosi. Mm-hmm. And then Jared Huffman, who's a Congress person from California, tweeted out, some of my colleagues are literally live leaking our internal Democratic caucus right now to CNN, The Hill, NBC, Politico, et cetera. I've gotten texts from three different reporters asking me to live leak juicy details to them. No, we, Dems in the media, need to stop this nonsense. So first of all, I, I've, I've been informed that leakers are patriots. All of them. So I don't know what he's complaining about. Second, if you're a Democratic Congress person, you could easily be forgiven for believing that members of the media are your friends because they are, because they defend everything you do. Okay, so this is a major problem for the Democrats. That coalition is not going to hold. That coalition is, is falling apart, in fact, because it turns out the people they should be listening to, like Abigail Spanberger, are being cast out by the people from pure blue districts like AOC. Democrats will never lose Brooklyn. Democrats could easily lose Spanberger's seat in Virginia. She almost lost her seat. To, to a Republican in a very, very purple district in, a, in what was supposed to be a bad year for Republicans. Okay, so that is going to break out into the open. But Democrats have no capacity to run away from it. That's the part that's hilarious. So this crystallized most of all in an exchange that happened yesterday via Twitter and other places. Claire McCaskill, former senator from Missouri. And she was on MSNBC and she says, the problem with the Democratic Party is you guys are ignoring all the issues people care about in favor of your culture war bullcrap. Here is Claire McCaskill pointing out the perfectly obvious. The Republican Party, I think, very uh, adroitly adopted cultural issues as part of their main theme. Whether you're talking guns or issues surrounding the right to abortion in this country or things like gay marriage and the right for transsexuals and and other people who we as a party have tried to quote unquote look after and make sure that they're treated fairly. As we you know, circled those issues, we left some voters behind and Republicans dove in with a vengeance. Okay, so she is right about all of that, right? You dove into the cultural issues, you ignored the needs of your own constituents, right? This is a proper take in an election where, remember, Democrats were supposed to win walking away. They did not win walking away. The simple fact of the matter is that if everybody who voted Republican for Congress voted for President Trump in Wisconsin, he would have won Wisconsin. There are 49,000 voters in Wisconsin who voted Republican on House ballots who didn't vote for Trump at the top of the ticket. Conversely, There were 69,000 Democrats who voted in Wisconsin and voted for Joe Biden at the top of the ticket and did not vote for a Democrat down ballot, which means that there are a lot of people who do not want Democrats in control. There are a lot of people who may not have liked President Trump very much. And so that's masking the Democrats' utter failure the other night. But that is a very shallow mask. Okay, and Claire McCaskill is pointing out that our coalition is not a durable coalition, right? So what is the response of the squad? of the Honorable Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Again, I keep, I keep calling her this because she has declared that despite the fact that her Twitter handle is AOC, we can't call her AOC because that's disrespectful to her and to women everywhere or some such nonsense. And having been accused of catcalling her for simply suggesting that we have a debate, now uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez has declared you can't call her AOC. So now I call her the Honorable Representative, the Honorable Estimable, Brilliant Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez D. Twitch. She tweeted out, why do we listen to people who lost elections as if they are expert in winning elections? McCaskill tried her approach. She ran as a caravan hysteria dem and lost while grassroots organizers won progressive measures in Missouri. 
Her language here shows how she took her base for granted. Oh, please listen to the Honorable Estimal Representative Ocasio-Cortez. Please listen to her, Democrats. The, the, the wonders and wisdom of this woman, beyond the pale, beyond the pale. I just, I love the fact that Claire McCaskill lost in Missouri to a Republican. And AOC is like, you know what? Sorry, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, Honorable Estimal D. Twitch. She says that McCaskill lost because she didn't campaign as a hard left Democratic Socialist in Missouri. Please keep listening to that. Do it. Do it. And Kermit the Frog meme, do it. Please, I'm begging you, Democrats, listen to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Continue along these lines. Suggest that Claire McCaskill is wrong, the culture war issues, the socialism, all of this is a good idea. Follow the squad down the rabbit hole. See, here's the problem for the Democrats. This is a real problem for the Democrats. They decided they were going to, they're, they're a dying party in some ways, that they are going to live off the lifeblood of the intersectional coalition. Like a, a 70 year old Hollywood celebrity bringing in a 20 year old and then having their blood filtered to them. Right? That, that's, what, that's what the Democratic Party has become. Almost literally, right? You've got 95 year old Nancy Pelosi trying to live off the life energy of Alexandra Ocasio Cortez and posing with her and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Right? That, that, is, that is the vibe. Okay, well, it turns out what happens if uh, the 20 year old that, whose blood you are living off of, what happens if that 20 year old has. Um, a blood disease. What then? That's the problem, gang. They have decided they're going to live off the energy of the woke socialists, and the woke socialists are not going to be complacent just being part of the coalition. They want to drive the bus. And because you need them, you cannot alienate them. And that's why Nancy Pelosi refuses to acknowledge that the other night was a bad night for Democrats, even though everybody knows it was a bad night for Democrats. If they acknowledge it was a bad night for Democrats, and that campaigning on Black Lives Matter, and the police are racist, and defund the police, and socialism is good, and transgender bathrooms, and everybody who doesn't like me is a racist, that that's a bad campaign strategy? The minute they acknowledge that, they implicitly rebuke the squad. But they need the squad. They can't alienate the squad. See, what's happened here is a process that the author, Nicholas Nassim Talib has called renormalization. So renormalization is the idea that if you have an extremely solid core of a small group of supporters who are intransigent in their beliefs, they can force everybody over to their side. So take, for example, this is the example that Talib uses. Take, for example, you have a, a family with one daughter who's a vegetarian. And that daughter who's a vegetarian says to mom, listen, I'm a vegetarian, you can eat what you want, but I'm not eating anything you put on the table that's not vegetarian. So mom now has two choices. She can either cook two meals, one for an intransigent vegetarian daughter and one for everybody else, or she can just cook a vegetarian meal for everybody. And then let's say that that family goes to a block party and there are 20 families there. And the family says, listen, our daughter, she's vegetarian. You can just make one meal for her that's vegetarian, but we're all kind of eating vegetarian in solidarity. And so, you know, you can make two meals, just give us the vegetarian meal and everybody else has the non-vegetarian meal. And so the organizers of the party, they go, you know what? It's not that much of a cost for us just to order one meal. And it's kind of a hassle to have to organize too. So now everybody's eating vegetarian because this one person is intransigent. That's the squad. The squad has said that we are willing to walk. The squad has said we are willing to take down members of our own party. Party. The squad has said we want to rule the roost and we refuse to take a back seat to anybody, including the so-called moderates that we need. And so we are going to take over the party. And Nancy Pelosi has no ability to defend against this, particularly because they can use their tactics against Nancy Pelosi. They can call Nancy Pelosi an old white racist. They can suggest she's out of touch. They can suggest she's too conservative, even though she's a San Francisco liberal. It's pretty incredible. So the Democrats have a world of hurt coming to them. Connor Lamb is making that clear. There's an article in the Washington Post today. Centrist House Democrats lash out at liberal colleagues, blame far left views for costing the party seats. An angry dispute erupted among House Democrats on Thursday with, de with centrist members blasting their liberal colleagues during a private conference call for pushing far left views that cost the party seats in Tuesday's election that they had worked hard to win two years ago. The bitter exchange, which lasted more than three hours as members sniped back and forth over tactics and ideology, reflected the extent to which the 2020 campaign exposed simmering tensions in the party. Even as its presidential nominee, Joe Biden stands on the brink of achieving their biggest goal of the year, ousting President Trump. But here's the thing. It was never about ousting Trump. And this is what I said yesterday. For Democrats, I, I, I'm old enough to remember because I'm more than 30 seconds old. When Democrats said the only thing that would save our souls is ousting Trump, if Trump remains in office, the, the world is lost. Now they think that Biden has won the election, and yet they are deeply unhappy. Why? Because it was never about their disdain for Trump's character or the fact that he was violating norms or anything like that. They didn't care about any of that. That was all an excuse to get rid of Trump and hopefully to get rid of Republicans across the country who they were trying to tie to Trump, right? That was their whole campaign. It turns out Americans didn't hate Trump enough for that, and they didn't hate Republicans enough for that, and they really, really hate the wokesters. They really hate the wokesters. That is the message of the election. You know who knows that? Everybody who's in a moderate district. 
Other centrists like Mark Vesey of Texas made similar points. Liberals, meanwhile, fired back. Representative Pramila Jayapal, Democrat of Washington and chair, co-chairwoman of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, argued that Democrats should not single out people and ideas that energize the party based. Rashida Tlaib accused her colleagues of only being interested in appealing to white people in suburbia. There it is. There it is. All the Democrats on the call are also racists who only care about the white racists in the suburbs, according to Rashida Tlaib. You guys decided to feed the alligator hoping it would eat you last. It ain't. It's eating you first. How's that feel? How's it feel having those alligator teeth wrapped right around your sternum? You enjoying that, are you? Yeah, you had that coming. To be real, it sounds like you are saying stop pushing for what black folks want, said Rashida Tlaib. Throughout the call, Pelosi sought to reassure her members the election wasn't as bad as it seemed. Democrats, she argued, have held on to about 70% of the 30 trump carried districts they won in 2018. She says, we held the House. We didn't win every battle. We did win the war. No, you lost seats. You lost seats. Okay, Democrats' messaging is terrible. It doesn't resonate, said Representative Kurt Schrader, a Democrat of Oregon, a member of the Blue Dog Coalition. When voters see the far left that gets all the news media attention, they get scared. They're afraid this will become a super nanny state, and their ability to do things on their own is going to, be take, th- is going to take things away. Several moderate Democrats in, said in interviews that Pelosi should have made a deal with Trump on a coronavirus relief package. Pelosi said she was holding back for a better deal, but it was a huge mistake. One, one lawmaker said it made us look like obstructionists instead of those up for the challenge the country needs. It was a huge mistake. Trump was like, I'm ready for a deal, make it bigger, and Pelosi was obstructing. Representative Sherry Bustos, Democrat of Illinois, the chairwoman of the DCCC who nearly lost her seat, is also facing member wrath. She defended her operation, argued that Republicans were forced to spend tens of millions of dollars playing defense. But that's not true. Republicans won a bunch of seats they weren't supposed to win. Privately, Democrats in interviews, this is according to the Washington Post, okay, not me. Privately, Democrats in interviews over the past two days have said the answer is obvious. The party in recent years has moved further left, with some members embracing such liberal ideas as free college, the Green New Deal, eliminating the filibuster, and adding justices to the Supreme Court. Many of the House's rank and file support those policies, though Pelosi and the DCCC have done their utmost to steer the caucus away from those ideas. At the same time, one member noted 130 House Democrats face primaries this cycle, with such groups as Justice Democrats defeating establishment Democrats seeking to punish members who aren't liberal enough. One lawmaker said there's no question that was a huge albatross on the necks of so many of our candidates who unfortunately went down. There has to be a reckoning within our ranks about this because a lot of Justice Democrats don't give a damn about the Democratic Party. They're all about purity and orthodoxy, and it is damaging our opportunities. Meanwhile, the executive director of Justice Democrats, Alexandra Rojas, she said they had one job and they blew it. We need a Democratic Party that stands for something more than just being anti-Trump. Connor Lamb, a centrist who barely won his seat on Election Day, said Spanberger was talking about something many of us are feeling today. We pay the price for these unprofessional and unrealistic comments about a number of issues, whether it is about police or shale gas. These issues are too serious for people we represent to tolerate them being talked about so casually. Correct. Correct. But do you think the Democrats can let go of it? You bet your ass they cannot let go of it. They will never be able to let go of it, ever. Because again, they are too attached to the message that everyone who opposes them only opposes them because they're racist. They can never look at a Trump voter or even a crossover voter who voted for Biden and then Republican down ballot or somebody who didn't vote for Trump at the top of the ticket and voted Republican down ballot. They cannot let go of the argument. The only reason to vote against Democrats is because you are a racist. This is why you saw late night hosts lamenting America last night. Here are a bunch of late night hosts lamenting the state of America. And and listen, listen, honestly, Like when I am looking for moral guidance, the people I look to most are late night comedians. They're the people I, when I look to the future of America, I think Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Stephen Colbert. These are the people I look to as the moral light of our time. The torch bearers for decency. Here are our late night hosts lamenting that America is so terrible, so horrible, so bad. And then they go back to their palatial estates where they don't have to worry about any of these issues protected by private security. He is a liar and a cheat who wants them to stop counting thousands of legitimate votes. And almost half of us are apparently okay with that. Be careful, America. If you let Trump do this, then voting could soon become one of those things that people do to feel better, but doesn't actually do anything. As usual, the state that got us into this mess was Florida. Every four years, Democrats hope they'll take it. But once again, last night, Florida was called for Donald Trump. Florida is officially America's cheating boyfriend. Why do we always think we can change him? Okay, yeah, you, you guys, th- this is the way to win. This is the way to win. Call everyone you don't like a dupe or an idiot or a racist. Go for it. Just go for it. Enjoy and see how it goes for you. All righty, we'll be back here later today with two additional hours of content. Otherwise, we will see you here on Monday for all of the latest sure to be a very lively weekend. So try to take it a little bit easy. We'll be back here to recap it all for you. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. <laughs> 
The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Our associate producers are Nick Sheehan and Rebecca Doyle. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. You know, the Matt Wall Show, it's not just another show about, about politics. I think there are enough of those already out there. We talk about culture because culture drives politics and it drives everything else. So my main focuses are life, family, faith. Those are fundamental. And that's what this show is about. I hope you'll give it a listen. 